Step 2. Light at an interface. So let's see what happens when a light is trying to go from one medium into a different medium. Before that, let's uh, 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 see how light can be described. So light can be viewed as a particle traveling in straight lines, so basically like a ray. And in order to describe that, we, all we need is geometric optics. This is the most easiest scenario. Geome geometric optics relies basically on uh, laws of trigonometry to describe uh, how the path of light changes as it travels from one medium to the other. Uh, next step up is if we are interested in the properties of light as a wave. And we've seen uh, this with the double slit experiment, that light can, light can behave as a wave, either when it's a, a laser light, coherent light, or in the form of single photons. And in order to describe laser light, particularly when it's traveling down uh, very narrow uh, fibers, we need Maxwell's equations and the full theory of electromagnetism. This description is a lot harder and we're not going to use it uh, here. And finally, the third one is uh, uh, the description of quantum field theory because light fundamentally is a quantum field, but we're not going to worry about this at all. We're only going to uh, use geometric optics, so the most simple description because mainly we will consider the diameter of the fiber to be much larger than the wavelength of the light. So here D is the diameter of the fiber and lambda is the wavelength of light. And to give you some ballpark of the, of the numbers that we're going to consider is D varies somewhere between from 10 all the way up to 200 micrometers, whereas the wavelength of light is around of the order of 1500 nanometers. So let's see what happens when the light arrives uh, at an interface of two media. We're going to consider one medium, usually the air, and then some denser medium. Let's call it, let's say that it's glass. And the light ray is going to arrive at some angle, and this angle will always be measured with respect to the normal to the surface. So we're not going to talk about the angle of incidence as this light, uh, sorry, as that angle, but the angle between the light ray and then this uh, orthogonal normal line to the surface. So this is the angle of incidence and we're going to uh, call it denoted theta i. What can happen is that the light can actually reflect off the surface as this at some angle which we're going to call uh, theta capital R, the angle of reflection. And also some portion of the light will get refracted. So it will travel into the medium at some angle, theta small r, the angle of refraction. Notice that all of these angles are defined with respect to this dotted line, which is the normal to the surface. That's very important. And often some portion of the light is reflected, some portion of the light is uh, refracted and actually it gets transmitted into the other medium. In this case, we're, we're saying that, for example, 90% of the light is uh, refracted and enters the glass, whereas 10% gets reflected back. But we're not going to be too interested in the relationship of how much gets reflected and how much gets refracted. We are more interested in the angles of reflection and angles of refraction. So, what, are, what is the angle of reflection? Well, that's very simple. The angle of reflection is just the angle of incidence. So theta i is equal to theta r. For example, if we keep increasing the angle of incidence, so we started with this light right here, but uh, then we consider a different light ray and then a different one, all with different uh, angles of incidence, the corresponding angles of refraction, reflection are also increasing. Now let's talk about angle of refraction. This is going to be a little bit more complicated. As you can see from this uh, image here, the angle of incidence and angle of refraction are different. So let's see how we can actually compute them. And for that, we need something called refractive index of a material. Refractive index is defined as follows. We're going to denote it as N, and it's given as C over V. So N, we said, is the refractive index. C is the speed of light in vacuum, and V is the speed of light in the medium. So really what refractive index tells us is how much 
does the speed uh, of light change in this new medium? For example, the uh, uh, refractive index of vacuum is just one. Why? Because in vacuum, the light travels with the same speed c. So c over c is equal to 1. Air has a slightly larger refractive index, but uh, for our purposes, it's basically just 1. So the speed of light does not change very much. It slows down a little bit, but very, very small amount. Glass, on the other hand, has a refractive index of 1.46. So it means that the light travels 1.46 times slower in the glass than co when we compare it with the uh, um, uh, speed of light in vacuum. And in diamond, it travels even uh, slower by a factor of 2.42, which is the refractive index of diamond. So let's get back to our example of light ray being incident on a surface. So we're going to denote uh, the refractive index of the top medium as Ni. I stands for anything that's incident onto the surface. And Nr is the refractive index of the material into which the light ray transmits and gets refracted. And the angles follow this relationship. So the sine of the incidence angle divided by the speed of light in that medium is equal to the sine of the refracted in, uh, angle, theta r, over the speed of light in the new medium. So we can use, we can use uh, this relationship between the refractive index and the speed of light in the medium, and we just substitute for vi, and we substitute for vr. And we obtain the following relationship. It's ni times sine theta i is equal to nr sine theta r. So the refractive index of the medium uh, on top here times the sine of the incident angle theta i is equal to the product of the refractive index of the new medium and uh, times the sine uh, of uh, angle of refraction. And this is known as Snell's law. And this um, law is very useful and we're going to use it extensively in this and following lessons. So, before we do any computations, let's see what actually happens uh, uh, with the angles as light travels from, let's say, a less dense medium into a more dense medium. So what that means is that Ni is smaller than Nr. For example, if we are considering the example of light uh, going um, traveling in air, and then trying to move into glass. Again, substituting into uh, of our Snell's law and rearranging a little bit, we've got Ni over Nr, so we brought this Nr onto the other side, and then we also divide it by sine theta i. So we've got that the fraction of Ni over Nr has to be equal to sine theta r over sine theta i. And from our assumption that we are traveling from less dense medium into more dense medium, we can see that the fraction of the left-hand side is smaller than 1. What this means, that this fraction over here also has to be smaller than 1, and that's achieved when theta r is smaller than theta i, meaning that the angle of refraction is smaller than the angle of incidence. So we see that when light travels from a less dense medium into a more dense medium, it bends towards the normal. Now, what happens in the opposite scenario, when we are traveling uh, from a more dense medium into a less dense medium? Well, we can go through the same calculation again, but this time we assume that Ni is larger than Nr. And we substitute it in, we see that the ratio on the uh, left-hand side of Ni over Nr is larger than 1, therefore we conclude that the angle of refraction has to be larger than the angle of incidence, so, if we are going from a more dense medium into a less dense medium, we are uh, refracting away from the normal.